amazing how quickly a few days go by. And I've got to get on that plane and leave. But uh, it's been a great time. You're so encouraging to me. I love you so much. Uh, uh, it's amazing how much this part of the world got into my heart. For some reason, I was uh, always attracted to Filipinos. I mean, that was before my son married a Filipino. Uh, I just always loved Filipinos. When I came over here, there was just something special. And uh, I was thinking about APLA and thinking about training programs around the world. There are different training programs. I'm not that familiar with a lot of them. But I, I don't think there's any training program outside the U.S., actually inside the U.S. I don't know of any other training program that has affected as many people by being a part of it as APLA has. I may be ignorant. I may not be aware of everything going on. I'm sure that I'm not. I appreciate everything that's being done. But this group has excelled. I was very grateful that Danny mentioned it was 12 years ago that we got together and there was a state of much disarray. Uh, Teresa and I uh, had come over. Frank and Erica Kim had come over. I think that was the time the two couples of us did something on parenting. Uh, parenting older children or whatever it was. Uh, it was also a time that we had a leader meeting. All the guys and women that had been on staff or serving as staff type leaders all got together and it was in disarray. That is a very kind way to put it. There was anger. There was great hurt. There were many tears. Frank and I chaired that meeting, and he and I were up there asking each other, what should we do? <laughs> it's not like Frank and I had the answers at all. We weren't sure what exactly to say in some cases. I mean, there were a lot of things going on in our movement of churches that had, uh, had a lot of different strands out there, and, and Frank and I, neither one felt like we had all the answers, so we're kind of passing the mic back and forth, not to be kind and allow the other person a chance. It's just... Sometimes we got asked a question, we, we didn't know quite what to do with it, but we muddled through that meeting, gave our best advice, and then one year later, I came back. I think Teresa and I came back. I don't think Frank and Erica were here that second time, but we had a meeting in which all of the same players, plus a few extras, but uh, whoever comprised the leadership group in the Philippines at the time, we got together and we talked back through some of the same issues and I could hardly believe that it was the same group. I was thinking, wow, did I get in a different meeting here? This Could that group from last year now be this group? I mean, it was phenomenal, the difference. I remember calling Frank and saying, uh, bro, you, you would not believe what just happened here. I can't believe it's the same group. But as I've been here then after that, and the steering committee had the wisdom to put together the, uh, the school there, they asked me to be a part of that. I was getting available uh, to be able to travel and teach a lot at that time and start an official teaching ministry. Although I've been a teacher for a long time, I was gonna to focus totally on that. But at any rate, we got together and talked about it. There needed to be a lot of follow-up and APLA was the end result of that. I don't know whose brainchild that was, maybe Frank, I don't know. But whosoever it was, the uh, group did a great job because everyone in the group really loved Asia and wanted to see things go well here. But the way things have panned out through all of the challenges, I think it says a ton about the Filipino people in general. One thing I've learned in the last 10 years, you go through a lot in your country. Uh, you have typhoons. You have mudslides. You have mountains collapsing, which has happened since I've been here and killed 15 plus people. I don't know how many they found now. Uh, you have volcanoes. You have everything that can fires. You have everything that can happen. I've taught in Apla when uh, students uh, walk through water in their own house to come to a session of Apla. And I would not, and I've told the story many, many times back in the U.S. and in other places, I would not have known which students those were except maybe look at their wet pants or something. 
but otherwise there was no different in attitude difference in attitudes the Filipino people because historically you have gone through so many challenges there is a resiliency that you have I had to learn that through the, the last 10 years but there's a resiliency that Filipino people have to handle calamity that is pretty phenomenal and it answers the question how could things have changed so quickly with the church leaders I just think it's a part of a built in character that you're blessed with by being <coughs> Filipino I really really do and of course Filipinos are all over the world uh, they are great servant attitude people and uh, you're, you're always put in the place of service where, you, where the people are met they have people from other countries they get to do other work but uh, if you're in the service business Filipinos will be the ones who meet the public because there's no one like Filipinos in their politeness, their kindness the way that you greet people they're always in charge on cruise lines, by the way, of the alcohol distribution. <laughs> because that's where restaurants and cruises make their money is on the booze. And Filipinos can sell more with their wonderful smiles and delightful personalities. They can sell more booze than people from any other country. I don't know if that's a plus or a minus. <laughs> but it is the truth. But I, I do think... In general, Filipinos are extraordinary people, and certainly once they find Jesus, they're beyond that. And so uh, uh, I could not have been more delighted than to stand up in front of my son and joy and perform their wedding. I could not be prouder of my Asian grandsons. They look pretty Asian. Uh, which is good. They took more after mom than after dad. And uh, I'm so cool with that. I think they are handsome young men. And they are. They have to watch themselves. The girls kind of crowd around. <laughs> the girls are drawn to my grandsons. I will tell you that. But they are charmers. They, uh, they, they are, they're good. But uh, I love you guys. Thanks for making my life what it has been this last 12 years. I'm glad we got to go through the hard times together because I came to appreciate you a lot more having had to go through the hard times and watch the way that you changed and the way you responded. I still remember in that convention center 12 years ago the sermon that I preached. I picked it out especially for you. I had an illustration there especially for where I thought the church was. And I think the church responded to it extremely well as I had prayed that they would. So, it's been a great ride. We'll see how much more there is to it. Maybe not. But I want to talk about a lesson today. Uh, already I've taken a long introduction that's not in the notes and Roland is very nervous about the time. <laughs> guys that are in charge are the guys that are nervous about the time or the guys that are speaking. But once I get the microphone, uh, I, I'm cool because I don't think anybody's going to come take it away from me. I'm, you know, I'm old and mean and crazy and so people usually let me uh, alone. But I want to talk to you about being joyful, confident, and unashamed. Now, Many words can be used to describe a disciple, right? Depending on where you are at the time. We can describe you as a disciple and say a lot of things about you. Many, many different words. If you're doing badly, uh, it could be negative. Well, he's weak. Well, he's struggling. He's having a hard time. He's drifting. He's in sin. There, there's a lot of things that could be said about a person who is doing badly, even if you're a Filipino disciple. Sometimes you're like Bong, talking about that time we got together. You're, you're down. You're in the pits. And so you'd have to use these kind of words. Other times, if you're doing well, uh, we hope that that's most of the time, it can be positive, excited, happy, fulfilled, purposeful, growing, serving. All of those good words about being spiritual and spiritually enriched and growing. One thing that's always going to be involved in our lives when we're using those positive terms you don't all have to take pictures of this. I'll give you, I'll give, I, I'll give Roland my PowerPoint and pass it on. Uh, but one thing is always going to be true. When the positive words are true of you spiritually, 
That means that you're tied into the Bible because the Bible is the power of God to change your heart and to get it back to where it needs to be when it's in the wrong place. And so uh, that is a very important thing. It's God's love letter to us. It's a lot of things. It is His Maker's manual instructing us how to live. Just like all of your little electronic things come with a manual telling you how to operate it. I have a watch I can't even set without the manual. Uh, it's so complicated. Uh, I don't know why I got that watch, but anyway, it's a very complicated watch. But we have manuals. The, the Bible is a manual telling from the operator, from the designer, here's how you function, follow these instructions. In another way, you could say it's a medical guy telling you how to be healthy physically, spiritually, and emotionally. It is that. It is many other things, but the Bible is an amazing book that tells you all about life, time, and eternity. As it relates to us in Apple, I want us to be, as the title of the lesson says, joyful, confident, and unashamed. And the reason I use the word unashamed is I had a verse in mind that I wanted to use, and it uses the word ashamed. But it's an ideal verse for our graduation time at Apple. It says in 2 Timothy 2.15, Do your best to present yourself to God as one approved. A worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. But it's interesting in this that he adds the word ashamed. We want to make sure we're handling the Bible well. We're learning the Bible. We're living the Bible. We're teaching the Bible. We're handling it well because otherwise there would be some ways in which we would become ashamed. I don't know about you, but I don't like being ashamed. I do not like being embarrassed. I'm willing to sit on a seat and cry in front of you while three people say nice things, but that's hard, right? It's hard uh, because it's a little embarrassing for people to say things about you that you wish you would become. <laughs> I often tell people after an introduction, my sincere prayer is, and I'm totally serious, uh, my sincere prayer is to become the person that you already think I am. And uh, so I, I don't like being embarrassed or ashamed. And the Bible actually says a number of things about being ashamed. And I want to share those verses with you, a few of them. Luke 9.26, Whoever is ashamed of me and of my words, the Son of Man will be ashamed of them when He comes in His glory and in the glory of the Father and the holy angels. And so if we're ashamed of Jesus and of His words, two things, they're inseparable in His mind. But for some people, they try to divide them. Give us Jesus, but we don't really believe the Bible. Uh-uh, that won't work. They're together. We can't be ashamed of Jesus and His words. Philippians 1.20, I eagerly expect and hope that I will in no way be ashamed but will have sufficient courage so that now as always Christ will be exalted in my body, whether by life or by death. Paul, in facing the challenges he was in, he was conscious of the fact that he could somehow shame Christ and therefore be ashamed himself. He understood the seriousness of being ashamed before God. 1 Peter 4.16 However, if you suffer as a Christian, do not be ashamed but praise God that you bear that name. And so when people make fun of us and call us names and uh, say we're out of touch and out of uh, a, a time thing, that we're caught in a time warp some other place and don't really belong to the modern age, when all that comes our way, even to our face, don't be ashamed of that. Jesus went through that. Paul went through that. Smile. You got to be persecuted. Jump for joy. That's what Jesus said. And then in the passage we just read, do your best to present yourself to God as one approved, a worker who does not need to be ashamed and who correctly handles the word of truth. As it relates to us today, and for the rest of our lives after today, what could make us ashamed and how can we avoid it? The three areas I want to talk about. Knowing and using the Bible correctly, if we don't do that, 
that could make us ashamed, right? That's what that verse is about. And so if you don't handle the Bible right, learn the Bible, use the Bible, you could be put to shame in some way. I remember the first time this deacon in a church, when I first started getting a bit serious about spiritual things and going to church regularly, this deacon called me up, named Robbie, and he said, Gordon, I've got to study with this old man. Would you like to go with me? We went over to this guy's house. He was blind. And by the end of the night, I was so grateful that he was blind. He was one of the original watchtower people that became the Jehovah's Witnesses. He was one of the original guys. And he knew more Bible than I knew by a ton. And he had memorized so much scripture, it was all about prophecy and things that I now know how to answer. But boy, he had Daniel and Ezekiel and a bunch of other things from the Old Testament and things in the New Testament, I didn't know what it meant. And he was quoting all these scriptures at night. I left there saying to myself, I don't want this to ever happen again. I am going to start studying the Bible and learning some Bible. I do not want to be embarrassed like that again because I could not help that man. Robbie couldn't either. Now his views were warped. He had false doctrine coming in one ear and out the other, but he knew a whole lot of Bible. He applied it wrongly, but boy, he convicted me. And that started me reading my Bible. I said, this will change. I'm going to become an expert in Bible. I'm going to know how to answer wrong doctrines. I, I, I'm, I didn't say then, but I wasn't surprised based on that beginning that the first book I ever wrote, full-length book, was uh, prepared to answer. Absolutely, because I went after it. I didn't want to be embarrassed again. Other times I left to study with someone wishing that I knew more about their theology and about the Bible. I, I got in a study maybe, I don't know, less than 10 years ago. I got in a study with one of our brother's physical brother. He was a young guy. And he had been in a church I didn't know much about. And we got in that study and he thought he knew everything. He was a very arrogant young man. Even though I was a lot older than him. He was an arrogant young man, but he knew a lot of theology it just was wrong theology and I said well here are some things to think about but I will study this further he gave me some material I said I will study this more and so uh, I started studying his stuff it took me I don't know a year it might have taken a year before I got no it wasn't that long because I got back with him but I studied his material out it's in the form of a uh, an article on my website called uh, uh, what are those two Chinese guys Witness Lee and what's the other one? Watchman Nee and Witness Lee and I called it I, I entitled it Watchman uh, Watchman Nee and Witness Witness Lee uh, a form of neo Gnosticism that's what it is but I had to figure out why it was. Gnosticism, a new kind of Gnosticism. So I had to really dig that out. But if I ever sat down with someone like that guy again, I know where their presuppositions are and how they're wrong. Most false doctrines have a basic presupposition. And if you can deal with that one, the whole system collapses. That's true of a lot, including Jehovah's Witnesses. There's only a couple, three things. That's in prepared answer. You can read that later. But there are times that I have been embarrassed. I was just embarrassed that I didn't know enough to answer that. But that drove me to study. It's okay to get embarrassed once with the same problem, but you better figure out that problem and how to answer it biblically. And so uh, that's what I have done. So we are students in Apple doing the advance assignments, the follow-up assignments, really striving to know more so many people have taken at least one course in APLA, and I commend you for that. And I challenge you to continue studying and digging into the Bible and reading other good books that can help you with the Bible. 
Uh, people like me and Roland, we write books. It's not the Bible, but hopefully it helps you with the Bible because we are teachers and we can teach in print just as well as we can stand up here and lecture in an oral form. And so I want you to keep doing that. Just for example, I do three kinds of Bible study, basically. One is, I read my Bible devotionally. I don't read it as a minister. I don't read it as uh, anything like that, a leader. I just read it as a disciple, and I want to know God. Show me what I need to see. I just read it as an individual disciple so that God can speak to my heart and help me grow as His Son. And then, of course, I do a lot of study of the Bible because I teach. And many of you teach in various capacities and various situations. You do a lot of teaching, and so I prepare in order to do that. I love to teach. I've got on my computer here probably a thousand sermons like this one. I hardly ever go back and preach one twice unless somebody requests it. Every now and then I'll preach one and different people will request it. But I usually write a new sermon. I had a thousand to choose from for this lesson. But guess what? I couldn't sleep anyway. Uh, so I, I just spent a lot of time working on this lesson for today. It's hot off the press. Uh, but uh, I, I did that because I like to keep studying. And as a teacher, I teach a new course. Why? I have to restudy teaching the course on Paul the first time I did it. I spent so many hours preparing for that course. And I've spent a lot getting back ready again, going back through that material. And I spent a lot of time writing the book. So I'm always doing deeper study that way. But then I do study just for me in deeper subjects. Sometimes when I'm teaching or I'm reading, I'll hit a topic and I think, Gordon, you need to know more about that. And I'll make myself a note, sometimes on paper, sometimes mentally, but I say to myself, I don't understand that so well, I need to go back and study it. I don't know how many times I've gone back and studied Ezekiel. That's the hardest book in the Bible for me. Revelation, I wrote a book about that when I'm pretty confident about Revelation, but Ezekiel is a challenge. I've gone through Daniel before, different times, because I'll forget something in there, what some of those symbols are. I've gone through Daniel different times. But uh, I, I, I just want to know more. I want to dig in the deeper stuff. Paul, uh, Peter said about Paul in, in 2 Peter 3, he said he has written some things that are hard to understand. Now most of Paul's stuff I'm pretty comfortable with. I can tell you two or three passages in all of his epistles that I still find a little challenging, but honestly not much. I've studied them enough and I'm pretty confident in what Paul's epistles are teaching even the hard places. But there are hard places in other parts of the Bible that I have to go back and dig into. So that's how I do it. What I'm saying is you need to have an insatiable appetite to keep learning. You need to be like Paul in 2 Timothy 4. You need to want your parchments uh, to be brought to you. Even when you are getting ready to die, it's got to be a lifetime endeavor to dig deep. And honestly, I can just commend you for doing it. This has been a phenomenal thing. I appreciate all the groundwork laid with, uh, with uh, the uh, steering committee. I appreciate immensely the leadership of the church here, Coco and others that have been so supportive of the ministry. All that Roland said amen to. Uh, but bottom line, this program says a whole lot, not about people like me that helped get it started. It says a whole lot about Roland Monet, but it also says a lot about you and about the leaders of the churches in the Philippines because they take after. They want to learn. They want to grow. And as 